Right, a very good afternoon to everyone here. Um, the fact that this is full is, a, is testament enough to the, to the speaker this afternoon. I must tell you, by the way, folks, we've been trying to get him along here for quite a long time. So this is a thrilling day for me that we've finally got him here. Uh, by the way, if anybody doesn't know me, my name is Andrew Lickerman. Hello. Um, um, it's a particular, I mean, a particular pleasure because also this is really, this is a, a part of Kamalina Ramdas's elective. So I'm very pleased to see the people here from the elective as well. And, and wonderful to have this excuse uh, to have Professor Yunus here. Um, some of you may know about all the initiatives going on here in this, in this area of social entrepreneurship. Um, we're not only interested in this as a subject, but also are about to set up a, an institute formally to deal with these issues and to do what we can in countries where development has not got as far as there has Western Europe and, and the United States, and where we feel that our contribution in terms of management techniques will be particularly applicable to enterprises on the ground of this kind. And my colleagues here, uh, Kamalini uh, and uh, Rajesh Chandi and Elias Papanayou, I mean, uh, three of colleagues who are very much involved in this. And also, I'm particularly proud of the fact that so many of our alumni are involved in this, this work on the ground in so many different countries. Um, I'm not going to say anything more because you haven't come here to listen to me. So can I now hand over to Camelini to introduce our speaker? Camelini. Thank you, Andrew. It's a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce Professor Yunus to um, the London Business School community. And I want to, uh, first, before speaking about Professor Yunus, I want to follow on to something Andrew just said about how important our alums are to us. And in fact, um, it was Rumi Ahmed. Rumi um, is an alum from the EMBA Dubai program. And uh, he is whom we have to thank for having uh, Professor Yunus here with us today. I, got, I had the pleasure of getting to know Rumi when um, I was teaching entrepreneurship in Dubai. And um, I heard from uh, Lamia, who is in Professor Yunus's team today, that Rumi apparently chased her across several baggage carousels at an airport somewhere to ensure that we would have this opportunity today. Thinking about Professor Yunus, when you, when you come across someone who's as inspirational as he is, I think what you do is you start to think how were his experiences different, his molding experiences? How were those different from yours? And what did he do differently? And uh, I know that he was born in uh, Chittagong in the countryside, and then he moved um, into um, the town, the city of Ch Chittagong, and uh, he uh, became an economist. So he studied uh, both his undergraduate and his master's degree at uh, Chittagong University uh, to become um, an economist. And I hope that uh, Professor Yunus will share with us those formative uh, childhood experiences uh, in those days. After he did that, he went, as is quite common for people who have done a master's in economics and uh, thinking of further studies, he went off to the US. And he studied at uh, Nashville, uh, in Nashville at Vanderbilt University, completed his PhD. And then again, he did something which you might do if you had finished a PhD in economics you would probably get a job as an assistant professor in economics. And that's what he did. He went to uh, Middle Tennessee University as an assistant professor. But that's, after that is when some of the differences started to appear. So in 1972, he decided to go back to um, Bangladesh. And at first, he had a job in the government. And uh, by the title of that job, it sounded like a pretty prestigious job to me, You know, one that I think people would want to have. But interestingly, after some time in that job, he decided he was bored. And he switched again to Chittagong University, and he was a professor there. And then in 1975, around that time, there was a serious famine that hit Bangladesh. And Professor Yunus uh, was going out into the villages to try and understand you know, what could they do to help um, the poor in the villages. And uh, very interestingly to me, as a professor of innovation, what he did was an experiment. So he figured out that if he took 27 US dollars, and he must have had some of those greenbacks having come back from the US, he figured that he could actually finance 42 women to get them out of a vicious money lending cycle where these women would every morning 
borrow money from a money lender to buy the materials, to weave baskets, which they would sell and then have to pay the money lender that same evening at a very massive interest rate. So he did this little experiment, and lo and behold, uh, the women actually returned the money, and then he expanded upon this, and this is actually what grew to become the Grameen Bank that all of us um, have heard, of, uh, heard about, which has um, you know, loaned money to millions and millions of, of people. And along the way, he has received many, many accolades, the World Food Prize, the Max Sese Award, and of course, in 2006, the Nobel Peace Prize, and, and many more yet. And so it is a, it's a great um, honor, as I said, to introduce you, uh, Professor Yunus, and I, I hope that you can uh, uh, share with us and, and inspire us further. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much. It's, uh, <clears throat> you already made my job easy. You told every, all the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got started from the university campus. Actually, it's my students who helped me to do that whole thing. And as we created the Grameen Bank along the way in 1977, sorry, 83, we became a bank. It's my students who became the first employees of the bank, and they became the uh, the pioneers of the work that we did. And they remained with the bank and grew to be the big executives when it became a large bank. So it's a, me and my students, that's what the whole initiative was. Along the way, we have learned a lot, uh, lending money to the poor women. First uh, battle was with the bankers. Bankers said this is a very silly thing, absurd things to do to lend money to people. It will not work, what you're doing. And it's a big battle between me and the bankers. They will not accept it. And I was becoming very nasty, criticizing them, condemning them for what they do, saying that they have uh, mutilated the whole idea of banking. Banking is, is a process which you take the deposits from the people and lend money to people who need it. I said, you do it in a very funny way. You lend money to people who already have lots of money. And you don't lend money to people who don't have money. I said, the whole purpose is different. The purpose would be the other way. You should be lending money to people who don't have money. And once you have done it, after that you think about the people who don't have, who have the money a lot. But that's not the way banks work. They laughed at me and kind of dismissed me. Uh, so it went on. And along the way, the bank that we are trying to create started to work. And we gave examples of that. They said, no, this is not going to fly. It will collapse. It's impossible. You cannot lend money the way you do. I said, well, I'll not listen to you. I'll do it in my own way. As long as it works, I'll continue with that. So it's a kind of a stubbornness, nothing else. I don't have any evidence to prove or anything, just a stubborn. And I think that helped me a lot, being stubborn and being defiant. So everything I did was a sort of a defiance against the way it's done. And when people tell me, how did you design this bank? Because after all, you needed some rules and procedures. Otherwise, why should people pay you back? I said, well, it was very easy. I said, all I have to do is to look at the conventional bank when I needed a rule or a procedure because they have been doing this business for a long time. And once I learned how they do it, because in the beginning I have no idea how banking is done. So once I learned that, I just do the opposite. <laughs> and it works pretty good. <laughs> and every step of it you see is the, is the opposite of what the conventional banks do. People know that you lend money to the poor women, a tiny little bit of money, that's all. So I said, ask those conventional banks to give tiny little money to the poor women. Would they become, become microcredit? No. But this is one piece of only uh, microcredit. Microcredit is a totality of the whole thing. I said, we created a bank which is almost the mirror image of the conventional bank. Because conventional banks go to the rich, we go to the poor. Conventional bank go to the city center, we go to the remote village. Conventional banks want to focus on men. That's what uh, they were doing in Bangladesh, still do. Uh, we focused on women. So bulk of our 
borrowers are women. Even today, when we have 9 million borrowers in Grameen Bank, 97% of them are women. So you can imagine how focused they are. Uh, conventional banks need collateral. We dismiss the whole idea of collateral. Absolutely no, no reason why we should have a collateral. Because I, I was again making remarks by saying collateral is, a, is an invention to protect the banks from the poor people so that the poor people cannot get in here. What are you doing here? Well, good to see you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, they, they, they just build the wall so that they cannot get in. I said, unless you throw that wall away, bank cannot get to the poor people. So that's the barrier which protects the bank from the poor people. So I said, get, dismiss that. So we opened it up, no collateral needed. Since you don't need collateral, you don't need um, lawyers. Because lawyers come with the collateral, all the documents and the papers and so on. Uh, so we became the only bank in the world which is lawyer free. <laughs> we have no lawyers. We, last year we gave out one and a half billion dollar in loan, in Gamin Bank. All this money went, no papers. And people say, oh, are you sure this money will come back? I said, for the last 40 years that they're coming back, so I will not be worrying for the 41st year that you, whether it's coming back or not. Uh, and the banks usually are owned by rich people, usually men. Grameen Bank is owned by the poor people and mostly women, 97% women, because it's owned by the borrowers themselves. It's a self-contained bank. It doesn't take money from outside as a donation, as a loan, or anything. It just takes the deposit from the people and lend out. And last year was an interesting year. Not only we take deposit from outsiders, we also take uh, deposit from the borrowers because each borrower has to have a savings account so that they can put tiny little savings in their bank account. Last year we had a very interesting result out of over years of this savings happening in the borrower's account. We, as I said, we lent out over one and a half billion dollars. The total savings in the borrower's account, in the deposit, exceeded almost two billion dollars. So you can imagine the whole idea of bank now. I tell the officials of the bank now, I said, don't call them borrowers anymore, because you lost the chance. Because you are the borrower, they are the lender. Because they have more money in their bank than you gave them. So where you start and where you go, and other things can happen. The issues that came along the way, these are very interesting for me, and I share with you, and I responded to it in my own way. The acquisition was, or reservation was, it cannot function, I mean, bank cannot function, because in order to function that, it has to lend money to the entrepreneurial poor. You cannot just lend money to any poor, because these are all, money to be used for starting a business. These are not con uh, consumption loan. I mean, bank doesn't give any consumption loan. So it has to be used for income generation purpose. We didn't use any heavy word. We said this money is for income generation. So you have to do something where you have money coming out of this it's investment. So conclusion was that you have to always in search for entrepreneurial poor. I didn't know how to respond to that. I said, I don't do it that way because I'm lending money to everybody. I'm not looking for entrepreneurial poor. Um, my door is open. Any person can come up and take money. I don't have a screening process where I see you as entrepreneurial poor. Then you have to have a history of entrepreneurship. I have nothing. Simply I know that he's a poor person. And our rules are to test out whether a person is poor. So that's very heavy on that. We want to make sure, absolutely sure, the person is poor. And our aim, our, our priority is one has to be extremely poor to qualify to join Grameen Bank. See, again, the reversal. Can you remember what the conventional banks would do? You have to show how rich you are so that they will choose you for lending. We reverse that process. We have to show how poor you are so that you become in our priority list so that we can go here. Yeah. So we have a whole series of tests to making sure at what level of poverty you are. So we do that. So entrepreneurship doesn't come into the picture. Then gradually I took a position. The position is, 
I don't have to check for entrepreneurial power because all human beings are entrepreneurs. See, makes my life very simple. <laughs> then they say, how come people are not coming up with their entrepreneurial ability if you think they're all entrepreneurs? I said, because our system is so rotten, they let people forget that they're entrepreneurs. They make people work for somebody else rather than bring up the entrepreneurial capacity in them. They laughed at me, oh, that's not true. People, they don't have the entrepreneurial capacity, that's why they work. I said, no, you push them into it by brainwashing them, distorting their thinking. That's why they just go and apply for the job. Job is not a natural thing for a human being. It's an artificially implanted in human being. That's, that's not true. That, con that controversy continued and continued. And it came in a dramatic way for the second generation of Grameen Bank families. Because we put all our attention to the second generation, children who are coming up from Grameen Bank families. 40 years of history, so it's not short history. Children who are born when the mother is already in Grameen Bank, already she has set up her office or set up her business. So we made sure every child in Grameen families goes to school. This is our responsibility. Again, we are differing from the conventional banks who don't worry what the, their children of their borrowers do. We do. We worry a lot. We want to make sure they do not repeat the history of their parents who never been to school ever. They're all illiterate. So we said we break the history here. This will be the first generation who will come out of that history of illiteracy and join the generation who will be literate, who will be educated people. So we gave them education, we gave them scholarships, we gave them education loans, we send them to schools, colleges, universities. They have their degrees, their master's degrees, PhDs, and so on. Thousands and millions of them. The problem began. They keep complaining to me. No job. We have education, but Bangladesh doesn't have a job. It's true, there's not many jobs for anybody. So again, I was in a, in a troubled situation. What do I do? Well, I made up my mind gradually. I said, what? who told you to have a job? I challenged them. Is it your teacher who told you to have a job? Is it your books who told you to have a job? They look blank, cannot answer that question. I said, whoever taught you that is the wrong teaching. Job, you remember, is an obsolete idea. Never bother about jobs. You tell yourself again and again. You get up in the morning, first thing you say, I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. And behave like a job creator. Act like a job creator. This is a completely different thing than think like a job seeker. By being a job seeker, you become small. You feel petty. You're not worth yourself. So being a job creator, you ch take a challenge and be that way. Many said, well, it's easy to say, but how do we do that? Nobody taught, told us, taught us how to become, a, uh, entrep become an entrepreneur. Nobody gave us any, inst any instruction about it. So we don't know anything about it. I said, look, you are son, you are a daughter, or a Grameen Bank borrower. Look at your mother. Ask your mother how she began her business. 20 years back, 30 years back, she took a loan, probably $30, probably $50. That's the loan size she had. And what did she do? Did she apply for a job with that money? No. She started a business, selling something, but making something and marketing it, and that's what she did. And on, along the way, she made step-by-step step move forward. That's what she did. And you come from that family, that tradition. Shame on you. And shame on your education, which made you forget that. If your illiterate mother can be an entrepreneur, what's wrong with your education? They're now forcing you to take a job someplace, work for somebody else. I said, forget about that education. Go back to your mother. Learn from her, for her, how to become an entrepreneur. If you don't have an idea how to start a business, she had an idea, illiterate mother had an idea, and she flourished it, she did it in her own scale. 
And wherever she is now, pick up that business, make up 10 times bigger. So you don't have to learn. You, have a, you are a lucky person. You have an in-house business consultant right there. So you don't have to go outside to learn about it. It's a business running in front of you. So why are you running for somebody else's business? Now they are listening to it. They said, why do you do that? Where is the money? I said, this is your mother's bank. Money is not a problem. We'll provide the money. Money is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is available all the time. So they started. Now we want to speed it up. So we created social business funds so that we tell young people, unemployed young people in Bangladesh, come with business ideas, and we become your investor. In the beginning, 10, 20 business plans submitted to us. We are happy that it's coming. As it grew, 100 business plans coming every month. Now we handle 600 business plans per month. We have exceeded about 10,000 businesses now running, all these young people coming. <laughs> So as we grow, the flow becomes bigger and bigger. There are endless number of people who can do that. A varieties of businesses, you'll be surprised how many ideas people have when you open the door. So I said, this is something, a very funny thing that we have to go for the job kind of direction. I said, look, when we came to this planet million years back, we are not looking for jobs. That's in us. That's what we are as a human being. And what we did, we became go-getters. We became problem solvers. We solved our own problem. That's what we were. We were entrepreneurs. Nobody was looking for a job at that time. Never in history. When we were in the caves, we were not sending job applications. From job number five to, oh, sorry, cave number five to cave number 10. Do you have a job for me? Nobody said that. Everybody was busy doing things. I said, that's in our blood. That's in our DNA. People distorted the earth. They said, you have to work for somebody else. And that's the distortion. The process of distortion began, and the distortion of the economy began. So I keep saying that, look, nobody, it doesn't make sense why any human being be unemployed. A well, healthy, young person why should we be sitting around doing nothing? It wouldn't happen in history before. Why does it happen now? Because we paralyze the person by giving the idea he has to have a job. So that paralysis, paralysis takes over. I cannot do anything. So what do I do? I go to the government, give me some money to survive. As if I'm some kind of a person who has no ability to handle my own affairs. I said, that's what the wrong direction we got. So schools and education system is becoming job oriented. We are kind of a factories which produces young people to make them work ready to serve somebody else. That's the wrong direction. I said, we'd be making young people to fight and create things for themselves, use their creative power to make it happen. That's the direction. So we got into this unemployment business, and employment business, I'll tell you later. Issues that came forward more in that direction. Uh, I was, as I did the Grameen Bank, I saw many other problems in the villages that we work with the poor people. So I tried to solve their problems in some way, because you cannot stay away from them. So I started doing that. Every time I did it, I created a business to solve it. I avoided the charity route. You want to bring health care because if you are poor, you are poor in health. It goes together. And so terrible those health issues are. You can't just stand idle doing nothing. So you want to do something. So every time I try to do that, I create a business to address that issue. So on the way, I created many such businesses along the way. I wanted to avoid the charity part. Usually, these things are done as a charity. You create charity hospital, charity clinics, uh, charity whatever, income generation, etc. I tried to address it by creating a business because I see charity has a basic problem. One, it's a wonderful idea. Charity is a great idea but one basic problem. 
The problem is, in charity, money goes out, does a great job, but the money doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of the money. And it always makes me feel nervous when you have only one time use of the money because then you have to find more money to do the same thing. And every year, sort of, you have to go back and raise money to do that. And getting money is not easy. Gradually, you see, you use more time raising the money than the time you use for doing the job. So I said, that's a very inefficient way to handle it. So what I did, I took the objective of charity and put a business engine with it. So that the money goes out, does the job, and comes back. What I removed from the conventional business, one thing, remove the whole idea of making, personally benefiting from the business. So that personally benefiting, personally making money out of the business is dropped out, which is the core of the conventional business. You have to make money. Maximization of profit and all that, return, et cetera, et cetera. I said, maybe that's not the right way. We stop it here. So we did that and created lots of those businesses. I will not skip that to save time and gave it a name, called them social business. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. So here, no dividend, but it's business, but focused on solving problems. Once you bring the business idea in solving problems, suddenly it becomes very powerful. So we created that. Then something else happened. Big businesses became interested in us. The first one was Danone from France. They were very curious. Why you do it? How do you do it? And finally they said, can we do it with you so that we can learn from you? I said, okay. So we have a joint venture, Danone Grameen joint venture, to address the problem of malnutrition among the children of Bangladesh. What we did after a long process of debate, discussion, developed a particular yogurt, put all the micronutrients into that yogurt, vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, and all that, which are missing in the children, and make it very delicious. Danone knew that part very well. How to suppress the ugly taste <laughs> and put a very, very attractive taste. And children love that taste. It became a very popular yogurt. We made it very cheap. Once you are in social business, suddenly costs go down because you don't have to have any frills. You get rid of all the frills. When you come to the basic production, it becomes very simple. So now it's a popular brand. Children buy it in the villages. We have a special marketing so that we can reach the poor form households. And we have a cross subsidization in the cities. We sell it through supermarket and have a price very high in the conventional market price, make money. We cross subsidize it in the villages to the children, to the poor families, make it very cheap, much less than the cost price. We make even by putting both together. So this is one. And then we had the joint ventures with Beulia, joint ventures with McCain, joint ventures with Yoglenia, joint ventures with Uniqlo, many things. So that idea is coming. Now this is spreading. Many other countries are doing that. And France has done that. In Paris, they have done that, creating a social business platform, bringing big businesses together so that they can all compete with each other, collaborate with each other to create social business on this, along the business they run. So that became an interesting thing. I said, this is very, very important. This is the last point I'll stop. This is very important in the context of the problem, basic problem that we are facing. Basic problem of wealth concentration. The system that we developed over years is always pushing the wealth to the top. The top is getting bigger, bigger, and bigger inflated. Rest of the economy is getting drier and drier. All the juice is at the top. Some will quote you that 1% of the total population of the world own more wealth, sorry, more than 99% of the wealth of the world. And it's getting worse every year. Next year, it will be worse than this. It will be less than 1%, owning more than 99% of the wealth. So I said, this is totally unsustainable thing. Not only unsustainable, given the problem of population increase, 
from today, seven and a half billion, soon to be 10 billion by 2050. So that's extra people coming in. When you say 99%, that will be bigger 99% because huge number of people there, only surviving with 1%. And if you take the 99% and take the top part of the 99%, the remaining balance of it will have a significant part of 1% for the rest of the people. So that creates a lot of social anger and unhappiness, uh, dissatisfaction, which reflects in politics, which reflects in society, unevenness. And not only that, all these 1%, they live in certain countries. They're not spread all over the world. That 1% is only in a few countries. So globally, all the wealth is coming to few countries and few people. That is totally unacceptable. Why does it happen? Because that's the way we created the system. Unless we create this alternative system to reverse the process, we are in a big danger. When people talk about Trump, I try to say, look, this is an outcome of that. People are unhappy at the bottom. And the politicians make use of it. They blame the immigrants. They, make, uh, they blame the refugees. They blame the minorities. They said, if you vote for me, I'll stop all this so that you'll have a better life for you. So people like it. And they promise I will build walls. So the wall builders become prominent. So that is Brexit, that is Trump. And my question is, what are the next two or three countries who will happen? Because that's, if it doesn't happen today, it will happen tomorrow, because that's the way it is. So before it gets too late, we have to wake up that we cannot carry on the business that we run today. Thank you very much. Can I have some water? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is a real test if you can open that. I um, did that. <laughs> I did that. Thank you so much, Professor Yunus. Since you were talking about Trump, I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, as you said, the, when, when we think about technology, we think about Facebook and Google and all of that as cutting edge technology. But then there's also, if you think about uh, middle America, you know, there are a large number of people who are in uh, small and medium businesses in manufacturing or even mom and pop type shops who are not really getting much of a whiff of all of this technology. And, you know, being a faculty and um, students and alumni of uh, a business school. Do you think there's stuff, or what do you think we can do to reduce this form of underprivilege? So this is not poverty, but this is another form of underprivilege. Well, let me put it this way to be consistent with what I said. Technology will drive the world tomorrow. It's already done. Technology today will be enormously changed in the next 10 to 20 years. And each segment of 10 years, it will be completely different. It will impact on everything. The speed is high, and the impact is enormous. But who drives the technology? That's the issue. Today, the drivers of technology are the money makers. Those who want to make money, they design the, business, design the technology or ask their designers to te design the technology so that they can make money from that. That's, uh, even if it's just a frill, they will do that because that's where the money is. They are not uh, concerned whether it's fundamentally changing you or not. Their whole thing is how much money I make by doing this. So the designers are busy doing that. So the drivers of uh, technology is the money makers and drivers of technology is the war makers. All the defense departments are making this. So these are the two drivers. As long as these two drivers guide this technology, Others who need this technology will only be beneficiary uh, as a kind of twisting this technology in their favor, using it, because, uh, manipulating it to make it happen. It was not designed for that purpose, but we can make it happen. I said, what we need really is a social driver of technology. You have a problem, you design a technology, it solves that problem. Then it's a social driver. Like, for example, healthcare. In USA politics, you have heard all the uh, debate about the technology, uh, about the healthcare, because healthcare is such a terrible shape in the USA. Uh, similarly, in other countries which are run by the state and so on, 
many complaints and so on. And uh, in the third world country, you can imagine how terrible the healthcare is. It doesn't go to the people who need it desperately. Today, I feel that technology can be designed to bring healthcare to the every single person in this planet almost costlessly. You don't have to spend anything. It's possible. Even your smartphone can become the deliverer of uh, healthcare. Today, already, there are many things on the thing that you can do to your uh, blood pressure or uh, uh, ECG on this, eye scanning. It already exists. Um, checking your ear, it already exists. And all you have to do is to download that app and get it done. You have your own record. If you can do your ECG every day, you can have a whole history of your heart condition and you can see where things go wrong, at what point, and why. You can check it, because prevention becomes a real healthcare rather than the cure of that. You don't do that. We're so busy in other things, because if you address those things, probably lots of businesses will be losing their business, because they won't be using those big machines and so on. So what I'm saying to say with that, you have the problem, but we need a social driver to address those problems. Otherwise, it's just to convert the existing uh, technology. This will take time. It's not appropriate. Probably is not be as efficient as we could be in the way it has been to do that in a way they can get the problem solved. Yes, technology is a very important thing, particularly in, a, in the area of uh, banking, for example. Technology can change the whole banking process completely. Thank you for sharing that Thank you. advice. Thank you. And, and, you know, um, since you were talking about apps, it just struck me, a lot of the apps today are about the sharing economy. Yeah. And in fact, we have a couple of, a few alums who have done work in the sharing economy. We have uh, Vinay Gupta who's sitting right here. He had a business where it was a car to, uh, peer to peer car rental. Yeah. And uh, Nitsan Yudan is another alum of ours who has uh, uh, had a business which is a peer to peer flat sharing, kind of like Airbnb. But if you think about all of these, many of these sharing economy models, uh, the presumption is that you have something to share, like you have a flat or you have a car, or even if you move away from the material things, you uh, would have something like, you know, you know a language, you know French, or you know computer programming, and you can share that. The question I have for you is, um, this whole sharing economy, how can um, the really underprivileged, you know, the poorest of the poor that you were talking about, how can they harness the sharing economy? Do you have um, thoughts yeah, that you can share with us? Basically, the point I was saying, if, we, if I'm a technology designer, I'll put them in our dashboard. These are the people I'm designing this technology. So I'll work for that. I'll come up with the technology. Today, I'm not doing that. I'm in my dashboard is what is it that exists uh, that I can manipulate so that I can make money. So money making is the central point there. I'm saying for a while, if I remove that money making part, focus on the solving part, suddenly many new technologies will come. Because that is the barrier now. I cannot go beyond that. Uh, I say, oh, if I do that, my profit will not be as much as if I do this. So I do this because that's my ambition. That's my target. So I said, for if we can have a next cubicle where people are working on how to solve this problem in a way it's a sustainable. I have nothing to, I don't have to take a penny out of it. Design will be completely different. And, and I'm wondering, you know, given that you have so much hands-on experience with these extremely poor people, sure. we have, for instance, Rajesh Shandi, a colleague of mine, and others are doing these uh, uh, business uh, trips with students going to... Uh, places like Johannesburg and going to the slums. The question I have is that you may have a better sense of what can these very poor people offer into the sharing economy? What kinds of things? Because they, you know, they can't offer knowledge necessarily, at least the traditional kinds of knowledge we think about, or actual goods. Um, are there, is there something that we're missing, which is sitting over there, which these people no, have? I, I don't know. I don't have the answer right, to your right, question. Right. All I'm saying, why do you want them to share what is it that you have in mind. Maybe we are bringing okay. some concept which doesn't belong to them. Their need is completely different. So you are trying to bring it from another world mm. to impose on them and say, they, see, they are stupid. They don't know how to do it. So they will be looking at us. They are the stupid guys. They talk about things which we don't need. See? <laughs> 
So I'm not saying it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely yeah, yeah. relevant. I say yeah. maybe we have to go for, see from their side. Absolutely. What is it that yeah. n- their need is? What is it that they can share, they can interact with each other? What is the need for them? Yeah. Well, that's that's great advice. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, and thank you. And, and well well heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, wanted to ask you a question since you spoke about healthcare, yeah. and you have done a lot of work on you know, Grameen healthcare, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you also spoke about how charity yeah. is a thing to avoid. And uh, some of us here at uh, London Business School have worked with the Arvind yeah, Eye Hospital, Costas uh, Multiple. Yeah, we learned a, a lot from Arvind Eye Hospital. We have um, our own eye hospital designed in Arvind. Exactly. But run yeah. as a social business. Yeah. And they're running it as a social business. One thing that we found out about Arvind is while they do a lot of their cataract operations yeah. for free, they sometimes have a patient who comes in who, uh, instead of cataract, they have something like a tear in the retina. Right. And they tell the patient, please go home and come back within two to five days. Otherwise, you are going blind oh forever. And a lot of these patients don't come back. And that surgery is actually much more expensive than the cataract surgery. It's often a laser surgery. Would you have, in your experience, you know, thoughts on how do you deal with this? Are there business models or something that we can do? Given, you know, Arvind will not take charity. Uh, my response to that will be human mind is very creative. If you take this as a challenge, as a problem, somehow you'll come up with the solution. I don't have to do it right now, but if I focus on it again and again, I'll come up with the solution. And may not be the perfect solution, but the very good solution. And then work on it so that we can handle that. It needs probably, just to give you a first cut of that, needs a broader thing, not just eye care. As a healthcare is a big system. So that I can interact with each other and cover her cost, who has a need for that special mm-hmm. surgery. And she doesn't have to pay. We, for example, we introduced uh, uh, healthcare insurance in our program. And the healthcare insurance is about four dollars a year uh, for the entire family. So we have a doctor, full doctor, and uh, pathology lab, and uh, health assistants, and so on. And we cover all the cost. It's for a particular size of population. Their responsibility is make sure keep them healthy, and it works out. The problem that we faced after about eight years, it was running very well. Uh, it was sustainable, we cover our cost and everything. People get the service. Problem face, doctors don't want to stay in the village. So we started losing all these doctors because government is hiring those doctors and they just shift. Because government job is a cushy job, practically you don't have to do anything and get paid. <laughs> and then you go do your private practice. And you are assigned to work in certain district far from the city, far from the capital city. You go there, join it, and come back next day, as usual work. And at the end of the month, you go and pick up the check. That's your job. <laughs> so people are very attractive to that, that job. And you get a promotion, you get a foreign training, you get everything. Right. So we lose people. So we are trying to see how to change that, how to bring technology into it. So we are designing things which can be done in a remote way, um, telemedicine and all sorts of designing equipments so that it's done on the ground, results, information passed down, and the final results come from the city because the doctor is there, those kind of things. Great, thank you. Thank Thank you for sharing. I'd like to ask one last question before we, uh, there are several in the room, I'm sure, who will want to ask you questions and get your insight. And my last question is, how did you learn to become so defiant? Where did that (laughs) that come from? Well, it's uh, probably, first of all, since you have no blueprint, right. so you try to do it in your own way. When it works, you look around, they are saying, no, 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 that's not the instrument. I see it's working. Why should I change? They say, no, it won't, it won't work, you change. I said, I'll change it when it start. I see that it's not working. And as long as I see it's working, I will not change. I'll improve it, make it more efficient, that's what I do. So in the process, it became a completely different system. Everything, you talk about the business, I talk about the social business. You talk about the banking, I saw the banking for the poor. It's a completely different thing. I said the whole, the, the concept of banking is wrong because the banking is designed, whatever bank is designed now, is basically, it's a bank for the rich. But we don't say that. When people see me, they introduce me like you introduce me. 
they introduced me as a banker to the poor. I said, that's great. I like that. You call me banker to the poor. If the next person is a banker, real banker from the uh, <laughs> uh, banking world and very successful one, how do you introduce him? <laughs> he said, you'll introduce him as a banker, as a very successful banker. And I said, that's what I'm complaining. If you introduce, him to the, introduce me as a banker to the poor, you should introduce him as a banker to the rich. <laughs> then it's over. It's very clear. But you are hiding facts. He doesn't lend money to rich. I don't lend money to rich. He doesn't lend money to poor. So in my case, you made it transparent. But in his case, you hide. Next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi. Is this on? It's on. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, a concept or maybe a philosophy that you talked about that underpins social business. And I think it's this idea that business performance can be unlinked from personal benefit. And I guess I really admire that, um, that philosophy, but I also know that it's like vexatiously hard to do you know, yourself, to really think about how you change your behaviors in that way. So I guess I wanted to ask your what do you suggest that we do ourselves to think about how we can push business performance whilst not thinking about our own personal benefit? Yeah. People, people tell me this story that, uh, yes, it's very difficult to get the people to do business, not to make money, because it's so absurd. It's unheard of. And I raised the question, people give away money? Is it absurd? It's not absurd. People always give away money. This week probably is a giving week or something. People are writing checks, giving away money. Every year, more than a trillion dollars is given away. I'm saying, why give away? Why don't you invest? And let it work for again and again. I say, charity money has one life. But the social business money has endless life. It never disappears. Keep on working, keep on working. It's much more attractive. So my first thing is not with the conventional businesses. I'm talking about the charity part of it. Why don't you bring the charity part to play this? It makes enormous sense. There's a business, it's a sustainable thing. It will continue, it will grow. It's a living organism. But in a charity, you don't create living organism, it dies. The moment you stop pouring the water, it's stop. Here, the first time you did it, it grows by itself. It's his own financing, and it can take its own surplus to grow, just like any other business. So that way, I think it's more, much more useful. Then people, uh, the conventional businesses, they have CSR. In CSR, what you do? Write a check to an NGO. I said, hold it. Would you consider investing this money to a social business? After all, it's already out of your book. It's gone. You're giving it away. But if you create a social business fund, put your CSR money into the fund and let it be invested in social business one after another. Each year it will grow. It will never disappear. So people might like that idea too. And many companies have their foundations. What do they do? Same the charity part. I'm saying, why didn't you use this? Your, employees, yourself, a lot of knowledge, lots of experience. If you put your mind in addressing something, healthcare, businesses, employment, whatever you are, you'll come up with brilliant ideas once you put your mind into that way. Use that. It doesn't cost you anything. So you're, you can use foundation. <laughs> many have their personal foundation. Same way. So I'm saying there are many ways. You don't have to rush to the, compete with the business world and so on. Uh, to give example from Danone, it's a very interesting, I should mention that. Uh, the company that we created in Bangladesh as a joint venture, it's a 50-50 joint venture. It's a $1 million project. Half a million we give, half a million they give, and we have the company running. As the company is registered, the, uh, we put our half a million right away. But the Danone doesn't give it to us, to the company. So we're getting worried as the time goes, months goes, weeks goes, they don't put the money. So he said, have you changed your mind? You don't want to put the money? You don't want to proceed? No, no, no. We have complete support to the 
company, but uh, we have a problem. What is the problem? Our lawyers are creating a problem. What is the problem they are creating? They are raising a very basic question. Shareholders gave you the money to make more money for them. Now you want to invest their shareholders' money into a company in Bangladesh, which upfront declares it will never give you any dividend. This is a violation of the mandate of the shareholders. You cannot use your money. So I said, what, then what happens? Well, we have to respect the legal issue, but we'll find another alternative. Then we have to wait another three months, and they really came out the alternative. What they did is a very simple thing they did. They wrote a letter to all the shareholders, some 3,000 plus, 300,000 plus shareholders, the known as, to every one of them, before their annual general meeting. They told the story of Danone, how successful they have been last year, and how much successfully they have expanded their business, how much profit they have made, what percent, what uh, um, dividend they are issuing this year, and so on, so on. And at the end, they said, we are creating a company in Bangladesh to do this, to address the malnutrition, et cetera. This told the whole story. We need half a million dollars for this. If you want to use your dividend money, here is the box. Put a tick mark. What percentage of your new dividend that you'll be receiving, you would like to invest in that? Remember, this company will never give you a dividend. It is dedicated to solve the problem of malnutrition of children in Bangladesh. That's all. 98% of the shareholders signed up. They were surprised. They were just looking for a small portion will do that. And they received 35 million euro out of it. <laughs> Just going directly, raising the right question, that's all. See, we assume that people always smell money. Wherever they smell money, that's where they go. Not literally so. If you place your case, people respond in the way you'll expect people to. They did that. But that created another problem for them. Their employees protested completely all over the world, wherever their employees were. Their question is, do you consider us second-class citizen? You asked the shareholders to participate in this business. <laughs> you didn't even bother to ask us. So the company was pressed to issue a next, next letter addressing the employees, telling the same stories, how much they would like to put in there. Another 30 million euro came. <laughs> so they have 65 million euro. Now this became a practice within Danone. Every year they put money into that from the employees, from the shareholders. Today, it's a 90 million euro fund. So they created a fund called Social Business Fund. They have been creating social business in country after country with that money. So this is one. See, we assume that nobody will do that. But simply asking did the trick. And it's not for one shot. It's a continuous process. So it's a question of how you address, how do you appeal to place the issue to the people. So that way, I don't, I don't feel scared, though, of what happens to it. Because naturally, people say, I want to solve this problem. If I tell you just one, it takes me X amount, say $10,000 or 10,000 pounds, to get five unemployed people turned into entrepreneurs. If you get me 10,000 pounds, I'll make that happen. In five years, 10 years' time, I'll give you money back. These people will be running their business. Many people will sign up. I'll give you the money. Go ahead and do it. Because you bring it to a level where it makes sense to me. I can use this money and care. And it can be done. Turning five unemployed young people into entrepreneurs is not a rocket science. Simply, we don't pay attention to it. We are so busy asking the big businesses to expand their business so that they can get a job. What a roundabout way of doing that, when we can do it right away. That's what the problem is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you know, I just wish that all the business leaders of today would think like you, and I can only imagine what the world would be like for our children if they did. Except me. And, um, <laughs> Absolutely. and you know, we're, we're here sure. teaching the next yeah. generation of sure. business leaders, Absolutely. and I'd like to ask you, 
what is it that we can teach them and how? Because inherently, I believe everybody wants to do good. Sure. So how Absolutely. can they get there? Yeah. What do you suggest? You see, you see now we're saying that no, people don't want to do good. <laughs> and you're saying people want to do good. And that's what I believe. People want to do good, but system we created stops it. They don't give us scope to do that. See, as, as a parent, I would go home and tell my children, promise to yourself you'll never work for anybody. <laughs> you'll create your own business. And it will happen. Today, they are working very hard. And they're looking around which is the big business they'll be working for. And they'll consider themselves lucky to get that job. And how do they do that? At the end of the whole letter, they step their career. I said, you're a creative human being. Why do you start at the very bottom? You can do anything you want. By the time you'll be going up the ladder, all your creative power will be gone, finished. Because your supervisors will make sure you become a little robots in bottom. I said, in most cases, jobs at the end of creativity. So why do you want to do that? You are a big creative human being. You can conquer the whole world. Why do you compromise yourself in taking this tiny little thing? And the whole world is waiting for you. That's the message. For, these young people are ready for that. And this will be the mismatch, that when you tell them they'll find a job. And do what? What's my future? I enter here. I wait for 30 years, 40 years, and end up there, retired person, did what? So we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of my life? Where do I do? What kind of things that I'm looking for? So the children should be thinking about that. The, among many things they learned, the first thing to figure it out, what is the purpose of my life? What do we do in my lifetime? How do I change this world the way I want? It's possible. So that's the challenge, that's the creative power. Not just going through the routine, one stop here and the stop here. That's not it. That's not human life at all. This is very unexciting life. Truly inspiring. Um, yes. Since you started the Grameen Bank, uh, there seems to be a, now a significant number of individuals who want to launch social businesses, uh, undoubtedly inspired by a lot of work that you have done. My question is, for the established businesses, whether large, medium, or small, what can be done? What needs to change to have them engaged on problems of inequity or hunger or nutrition? And especially in a business school context, what can be done to get them more involved? Sure. One idea that I propose to business schools, I said, now you give your MBAs, if your young people learn how to run a business, how to go out and join a company and make dedicate your skill to that company so that the shareholders make a lot of money. That's the whole purpose. I said, fine, you do that. I can't stop it. Would you consider opening another department to give social MBA? How to design a social business? How to run a social business? What are the social business doing? How can you improve those social business to be more effective, more efficient? So you're offering only two MBAs. One is a conventional MBA, another is a social MBA. So when they come out, they know how to run a social business. The guy who is coming out of the conventional MBA, he doesn't have a clue how to run a social business. He's, he knows how to make money and how to do the advertisement, how to push the sales, how to brew the marketing, everything he knows. But he doesn't know this one. So my education is one-sided. So this is one business can do. And if you're learning in this conventional school of MBA, I would say, okay, now I cannot change that, but can you introduce the subject social business for them? So that you say, whatever business you're running, this is the way to create a social business alongside, which may be quite compatible with your basic business you have. One, for example, your business make a lot of waste and you are very generous about creating waste in your business. And it's part of the cost, and you pass it on to the consumers, consumers take it, you don't make a fuss about it, you dispose it off. Can you create a social business as a separate business to recycle this, all the waste that this company makes, so that it's in the loop, continues in the world, doesn't disappear? It's possible. One social business, just to quick, take a few minutes, one social business that came in France. We started with them, it's McCain. This is a potato company. 
So French fry company, everybody knows. I didn't know that. <laughs> I have never heard the name McCain. They came to me, they're very, very eager to do social business, very excited about social business. So I said, okay, one company wants to do social business. I said, what do you do? He was very embarrassed because I didn't know. I, he, they gave the name and everything, but I didn't know. He said, he kind of turned it around. He said, do you like French fries? I said, yeah, I like French fries. Next time you eat French fry anywhere in the world, you remember you're most likely eating McCain's French fry. I said, oh my God, you're big. <laughs> he says, yeah, we're big. We're more than 50% of the market share of the entire French fry industry. So that's us. So we created a social business in Colombia called Campo Vivo. It's a joint venture. That's a long story. I'll don't go into elaborate. We're doing very well. But they got so excited with the Colombian experience. The guy who runs the European operation of potato based in France, in Dill, he got so excited, he wants to do it himself. He said, let me do it in France. France grows lots of potato, so I want to do it in France. And he, invited, he said, you must be present when I make the announcement. You know, I'll have a big conference, and in your presence, I'll announce McCain is growing a social business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I came, he announced. What is the business? 26% of the potato grown in France, just to France, 26% of the potato is thrown away. Why? Because 20% of the potato are de-shaped. They cannot be turned into French fry. They cannot be turned into chips. So companies don't buy it. Farmers have no use for it because that's only, uh, they can con consume a few kil kilograms, but not all of it. But there are tons of potatoes, so they just throw it out. 6% of the potato cannot be put out from the ground because big machines which collect the potato cannot pick this 6%. So in all 26%, nobody bothers about it. Business goes on. Now that he has a social business mind, he thought about creating a social business. What? He took the unemployed young people of France, few of them, and created a company to collect all the throwaway potatoes with a cheap price so that farmers get some price, but they don't have to throw away. They collect it and design some implements in collaboration with the engineering universities. They hand-picked potatoes from the ground, not big machines, so that out of 6%, some 4%, 5% can be picked up. So you have this potato available. What do they do? Make potato soup, social business potato soup, <laughs> simple. And one of the chef, he got so excited with the idea, he announced that he will design a special potato soup recipe for France. <laughs> and he will let the company use his image on the back packet so that people know he designed this recipe for this purpose as a social business. Now it's running very well. It's a very simple idea, but this potato was just thrown away. Then. What happened? Next grade, he got so excited now, he, this is the second year, he, moved, he expanded his business. How? There is a class of vegetables, I never heard of it. I don't know if you heard of it. They are known as ugly vegetables. <laughs> that thing exists. Because, because supermarket will never put it on their store, the ugly vegetables. Because they are deshaped, crooked, and so on, consumers don't like it. They like it a little big, neat, neat, neat shape. Military operation. <laughs> Everything is in line. So those who don't fit into that military operation doesn't get there. So they throw away. McCain guy thought about this could be another social business. So he integrated the social business. He buys up all the ugly vegetables and chop them off so that nobody knows how, what the shape was. <laughs> and make that fresh vegetable in little packets. Ready to cook vegetable. Now it's selling very well. It's a good food, but just because they didn't have the right shape, they were condemned into waste. This is it. So these are not isolated examples. In businesses, you have all of this. And all you have to do, you have to get this bug in your mind that I can make use of it for the good of the society, that's all. And now this business is expanding in Belgium. And I'm invited to announce it again. A new country, Morocco. Same thing, potato soup, because the potato soup thrown away. So now it's expanding to Belgium, Morocco, and Greece, which is started in France. 
So once you start it, it's a tiny little thing. If the idea is so powerful, immediately everybody says, OK, that's a great idea. I can do it too. All you have to do, get your mind, mind off your profit-making lens. You take off your profit-making lens, put it the social business lens, suddenly you see things differently. And it helps. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> We have time for one last question, okay, but yeah. before that, I just wanted to briefly mention that Amit, who asked you that question, yeah. has also saved wastage of a lot of vegetables See, through a social business. And he's an alum who, uh, through Reuters Market Light, basically Fantastic. price information to poor farmers. Thank you. OK, you do that, ugly <laughs> vegetable. I didn't know that. I would surprise the world, ugly vegetable. OK, thank yeah. you so much. I found what you said very inspirational. I'm going to go home tonight to my children and yes. tell them about job creation. Absolutely. And it's interesting in this country, we even have a job seekers allowance, which is very disempowering. Absolutely. So that's that's I'm, what it's I'm totally called. It, yeah. And I think the language around that yeah. is disempowering. And when you talk about job creation, sure. suddenly you give people power. Absolutely. Um, I was just thinking about what you said about the elections. Um, how do you... How do you show empathy for people who are so different to you? That has been one of the key things that's come out, that we just haven't had empathy for the others. So how do you really, you know, you went into such a different community to you. How do you really demonstrate empathy? And I'm not talking about sympathy, which is feeling sorry for someone. I'm not talking about poverty tourism. I really want to know how you've done that. And, and what we as a group, as a privileged group, can really learn from you about empathy. Yeah. You see, as long as you're in a money-making world, our, may, our eyes get fixated with the money. We don't see people in our, the lens that we have in our eyes, the glasses that we have. We see money in our eyes. Once you take this off and put the social glasses on, you see people differently. Suddenly, they look like your neighbors. They look like your friends. It, you are not distancing yourself from them. You are bringing them in, and you want to do things together to solve problems. When you solve problems together, you call it in, uh, unemployment. If you get the, um, these young kids coming from those families, you turn them into entrepreneurs, you feel good. That's because you did it. In, social, in your conventional business, you're not doing anything for them because it's all through the store, very impersonal things happen. Here, you are personally interested. You said about the unemployed young people and uh, unemployment benefits and so on. Took a look at the welfare system itself. Why they are in welfare in the first place? Because they are unemployed. We are talking about the youth unemployment. There's a big range of unemployment. Why should anybody be sitting idle? That doesn't fit into human beings. That's my point. Something is absolutely rotten in the system which condemns these people, said you reject. You sit there, I'll take care of it. Don't bother, don't shout on the street. I'll take care of it. That's not a solution. Human being is a very creative being. Put them into prison. Doesn't help. You're taking away the basic right of a human being. I want to be creative. I want to be outside. I want to party, play my role. You took it away from me. Just give me the food, that's all. That's not the right thing to do. So I said, well, how do you do that? I said, let's try. I'm not saying overnight it will be solved. I gave the example in Bangladesh. We are doing it in my presentation. It's one by one. And if I see my friend is getting into business, I'm sitting around. I said, no, I'm, business doesn't suit me. He does it. Then third friend, fourth friend, fifth friend, all went to business. What the hell? I, maybe I should do it too. <laughs> so that's how it goes. So in the beginning, it will be a very slow process because your mind is trained to do things in a different way. Suddenly it emerges. All these illiterate women, how did they become businessmen? Because they see from each other. Not only it in Bangladesh, because they saw and it grew all over Bangladesh, now it's all over the world. And I gave you the example of the USA. These are undocumented women. Probably Trump will throw them out. <laughs> they are the one taking money and creating business for them. And we gave half a billion dollars already in the last eight years to 80,000 of these women starting loan about $1,000. Do the haircut. This is a one job. Take care of the pets. 
grooming up the pets, taking care of the pets, daycare center, making little ornaments, those kind of things. Things they know how to do. House cleaning. Just buy a machine and cleaning your house, I get paid. And this is my business. I have a business card. I pass it around. If you need your cleaning, give me a ring. I'll come and clean you. This is my rate. That's it. It's not an art shattering idea. I know that. I work for somebody. I'm out of job. This is what now I can do. Give me the money. I can buy the machine and I can do the job. That's all. So those are the things. It's a question of putting the mind into it. That's all.